It's Annika Clark, and I'm a consultant clinical psychologist at Southwest London St George's Mental Health Trust in um, Children and Adolescent Mental Health Services. And I'm part of a number of teams across our trust who work directly in children's schools. So you may have heard in your children's schools um, talk about mental health support team or CWPs or EWPs. They're all part of our early intervention mental health programme in schools. And so we're um, giving the talk today from the Merton Mental Health Support Team. And the talk is about parenting unmotivated and fed up teams teens. What can parents do to help? So I'm just going to start with a little bit of context and then we're going to move on to thinking about some practical things around what parents can actually do. So obviously at the moment we have got um, let's have a look at this one. Here we go. So obviously at the moment we're in the middle of COVID uh, lockdown, um, the third lockdown I think it is, and there are a number of challenges. None of these will be new to you, but these are the things that teenagers and parents are all struggling with at the moment. So part of the challenges are that um, children are not in school at the moment. There is uncertainty about when they're going back. We have a we have a date that's hopeful, but we're not sure. Families are spending more time than ever all in the home at the same time. Um, teenagers have limited social connection to their friends. They may be online with them, but they're not seeing them in person. We know that there's um, all their usual activities have dropped off. There are far fewer opportunities for doing things than usual. So what kind of feelings might your child be having at the moment? There are some children are doing OK, but an awful lot are very fed up at the moment and it's understandable. This feels like it's been going on for ages and it has. It's been going on for the best part of the year. So, uh, you know, they might be feeling frustrated, drained, um, bored, restless, lonely. Um, isolated, lots of these different feelings. And actually, these might be mirrored in all of us as adults as well. I mean, there are very few of us who aren't utterly fed up at the moment. If we move on to the kind of thoughts that um, teenagers and parents are having at the moment, there are lots of thoughts around, you know, just want to go back to school for lots of teenagers. They are quite fed up of being at home. They're fed up of the same four walls. They want to be out. They want to be doing things. They just want life to get back to normal. There are other worries too. For lots of people, there are financial concerns at the moment. Children pick up on that. Um, they want to see extended family. They just feel like they can't be bothered with online learning anymore. They might have worries about not feeling safe, wondering what's going to be happening. Um, they might have worries about grades. There's a huge amount going on. And then, of course, there's the one on the left about, you know, my parents are driving me crazy. Well, they might be driving you crazy as well. So I think, you know, it's understandable that at the moment things have come to a bit of a crunch in many people's households where um, lots of teenagers have had enough. Um, I think somebody else has started sharing the screen, which is not very helpful. Let me just get it back on again. Let's see if we can get back on track. So look. Um, so hopefully you can all see the screen again. Uh, Rosie, you'll have to tell me if there's a problem. No, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so there is a bit of a crunch point at the moment where, um, you know, everybody is feeling very fed up. And I think um, what we're all very aware of is teenagers at the best of times can be quite moody. They have their ups and downs. They don't, um, you know, it's very hard to predict sometimes about what kind of teen you're going to get each day. So one minute they might be joking with friends and then you make a comment or you do something they don't like and then Armageddon breaks out. And so 
quite clearly, oh dear, we're not on the proper slide here, quite clearly, then we can also get to the stage where, um, you know, you say one small thing and this happens. They feel like they're just on the edge. Everybody's on the edge at the moment and it's quite easy to push them over. It can feel at the flip of the switch you get a sudden outburst and that's from a teenager who's previously been very lethargic lying on the bed but then just suddenly things flip. Now at the moment um, most people are more stressed and fed up and that might uh, show itself in different ways so I think it's I mean it is normal at the moment that everybody's tolerance is lower than usual. So on the one hand, you might have teenagers who are very low and lethargic, and on the other hand, you might have some who are pacing around the house or flat like caged tigers. And I think, you know, there isn't just one way in which this is affecting teenagers. So on the one hand, you might have teens who are almost more aroused than usual. They're on the edge. They are very quick to say, I can't do this. I don't like this. Nothing's right. They might find it hard to focus. They might not be watching their online lessons. They might be staring at the window. Their temper might just be a little higher than usual. Um, and their head just might be all over the place. On the other hand, you might have a teenager who's just slow to get up in the morning, doesn't want to do anything, finds it very difficult to engage with anything, feels like they are really switched off there. Their um, arousal levels are quite low. They're really not feeling like they can manage very much at the moment. They don't have much energy. And both sides are normal responses to stress or to difficult situations. So they're both normal sort of dips in variation. You might find that you've got some teenagers who flip from one to the other. So in terms of what you do, how do you manage teenagers when you've got either one or the other, but they're really not very motivated to do much, they are on edge or they're just feeling really slow. Well, the first thing is actually if you follow airline principles, the first principle, if you're if you're in any kind of crisis, is to put on your oxygen mask yourself before you try and take care of anybody else. And the reason I'm mentioning this is because it's always a bit at the end of these kind of talks or when people talk to you and they say, well, you've got to look after yourself first. It's always a bit of an aside. But actually, if you've got a very fed up, unmotivated teenager and you're also feeling fed up, and a bit unmotivated or more stressed than normal, you're not going to be able to manage them in any kind of way that's helpful unless you stop and take a moment and just think about what do you need to be able to deal with a difficult teenager? What's going to help you stay calm when you need to? What's going to help you manage? And what I've got on screen here is a little diagram that we call the stress bucket um, or the, the sort of looking after yourself. Uh, it's an analogy for looking after yourself. Essentially, if you're under more stress and strain, your bucket or your capability for tolerating things and being able to take on things is going to be much smaller. And there's a lot going on at the moment that fills up our buckets. Uh, we have worries about how our kids are doing, you might have worries about your own work, whether you can keep up, whether you're being made redundant. Uh, relationships are under strain like never before. Um, you know, um, partners can be at each other's throats a bit more or um, there's an awful lot of uncertainty around. You might be experiencing bereavement. You might yourself be missing all your friends and wondering when you're going to be able to see your extended family again. There's an awful lot going on. And the tap on this bucket represents the release valve. So how do you, for yourselves as parents, have some release from all of this? 
that's going on? How do you manage it? How do you get some rest and relaxation time for yourselves? How do you look after yourself, take care of yourself, show yourself a little bit of compassion, do some things that are just for you, some things that you enjoy? Um, are you able to get enough sleep yourself? Are you able to squeeze in some exercise? So it's not an aside. Actually, if you are worried about your own children and you're trying to work out what's best for them, you're not going to be able to have the space to do that unless you're thinking about yourself first. Because what we know about teenagers is they're, they're not always that easy to manage. So you need to be in a better place yourself before you start thinking about what you can do for your child. And we all know that if you haven't had much sleep, you're stressed, you've got a lot of work on, as a parent, you're bound to be more snappy, less tolerant, less able to cope with them. So do put a little bit of time into thinking about what you need for yourself before you can come to thinking about how you can help motivate your child. So as parents, you will all know that getting good sleep eating well, looking after yourself, doing some exercise, feeling like you're doing some good in the world are all the things that teenagers need to be doing. Um, and as a parent, it can feel really, um, you can really feel like you just want them to get up and do some of these things. You know what they need, you want them to do it. And it's very easy to slip into a role of nagging, pushing, prompting, feeling really fed up with them as well that they can't do what you know is right and as parents we have lots of ideas about what our teenagers need to do to look after themselves and we quite often have quite a lot of advice to give them now the difficulty is if you've got a child who's fed up and unmotivated themselves and you get into nagging prompting reminding pushing mode it's generally not going to end well, even if you're absolutely right about what they need to do. So the first step is to think about, yes, you know some of the things they need to do, but take a step back from trying to push them into doing it and let's think about what you can do before. There is a role for pushing teenagers a bit, but let's take a step back and think about what you can do before then. So when you're trying to work out what you need to do with your teenager, think about um, think about what you value and think about what is important right now. So the reason I've written what is important and what is it just irritating is that as parents, it's very easy to make lots of comments about your children. So if they've got their feet up on the sofa and you've told them a hundred times not to do that, if you walk into their room and there's stuff everywhere, you want to be able to say to them, God, what is going on in here? You know, can't you even just? Those sorts of phrases that just slip off the tongue far too easily. And for all of us, it's very easy as a parent of a teenager to get stuck into just, um, you know, all the things that we find quite irritating. We've told them hundreds of times, why is that towel on the floor? You know, why can't you just do this? Um, have you thought about that? Why aren't you doing this? I've told you a hundred times. And actually, if they're already unmotivated and fed up and you're stressed, that's going to lead to another sort of volcanic explosion and it never ends very well. So try and think about before you say something to them, is it really important? Is this going to be something that's really important in terms of their health or their grades or their future? Or is it something that's just irritating you in the moment? So what you want to think about is when you say something to them, make sure that you're thinking about what's of value, because if you're finding it irritating, you're going to speak in a way that they're going to find irritating and then you've got flashpoint. So try and take a step back from all the little things that are annoying you and think about what's the bigger picture here? What do I want to get them to do? And when you're thinking about what do I want to get them to do, it's very easy as a parent when you've got um, a teenager who's not really working with you and is fed up, you either feel sorry for them or you feel cross for with them. 
And if you feel sorry for them, it's quite easy to get into a position where you want to offer them things to do the things you know they need to do. So you get into that carrot approach um, and you might start thinking about bribing them or giving them big rewards for doing things that really they should be doing anyway. And on the flip side, if you're feeling angry with them, there's an urge to kind of um, get the stick out um, to set up, uh, you know, punishments or threats or try and coerce them into doing things, getting cross with them, trying to really push them hard. And what we know is that sort of more manipulative approach where you're really trying to push somebody into doing something. Sometimes it will work. But there is always a cost and the cost is quite often at the expense of your relationship with them. So if you're really pushing and coercing and threatening to get them to do something, then they are going to feel quite resentful. They're going to kick up a fuss. They're going to not want to let you feel like you've won. It sets up a fight situation. And if you're bribing them um, or setting up big rewards for things that really they should be doing anyway. The message you're giving is that they don't need to do anything unless they get a reward. So it's just to be a bit careful about it. You might feel desperate, but try and take a step back if you feel like you're heading down the manipulation route. True motivation has to come from within. It has to be when somebody says, I see what you mean. I do want to have a go at doing something different. I want to give it a try. That's what motivation is. And you can encourage it. You can set the scene for it. You can you can support and help with it. But it's not the same as that sort of really pushing them or bribing them. They have to take some responsibility for where they are and want things to be different. Now, how you do that or how you set the scene for that, we're going to come on to, but it is really worth just thinking about the difference between the two. The first thing you can do is to just look at where they are at the moment. Now, lots of teenagers are doing things that parents don't particularly like. A lot of them are spending a huge amount of time on screens, whether that's gaming or on social media or just randomly scrolling, watching YouTube. Lots of them are spending far more time on screens than they even used to. And lots of teens were on screens too much anyway. So take a step back from how much you like what they're doing and just think about how you're going to connect with them where they are at the moment. So whatever they're doing, take an interest in it. Try and meet them at the point they're at at the moment show some interest in what they're interested in even if you're even if you really don't want to encourage it and you feel like well i don't want to talk about gaming or what game they're playing because i don't want them to be doing it i don't want them to take that as encouragement just try and put those thoughts on side show a bit of interest in what they're interested in try and join them in their world a little bit and try and get them on side so that they feel like you are genuinely showing an interest in them Try and stop the talking part. As parents, we're very prone to try and encourage, give advice, prompt, nag, remind. Take a step back from talking to them and really focusing on listening. Ask them questions. Try and show some genuine interest in their position. You know, you can make comments to them. You're spending a lot of time doing this. Show me what it is that interests you about it. Show me what it is that you like about it. Help me understand because I don't get it um, and show some genuine, genuine empathy for their position at the moment. You know, it's really hard. You're not able to go out much. I, you know, even if you don't like them on screens, at least show, try and show some understanding about that you understand there's very little else for the, that they feel they can do. You might think there's a lot else they can do, but for the moment, just try and sit with them where they are. The most important thing you can do with a teenager who is feeling low, feeling fed up, not connected, is to try and help them see that you are on their side, that you are, you want to be with them, you want to meet them where they are and join with them. Once you've done that, then you can come back to all the things 
that you know they need to be doing more of um, and all the things that you know they're important that are important and you can have a think to yourself not with them just have a think to yourself are they getting enough sleep are they eating well do they have things they enjoy are they able to get some rest? Are they getting out and seeing some daylight or are they in a darkened room all day? Are they able to do any exercise? So for, for yourself, go through some of these basics that you all know they need to be doing more of and just think about where, where they are with each of these dimensions at the bottom of this diagram. Think about how they're doing for your own, for your own peace of mind really. And then once you've done that, have a think about this. Think about what can you actually have some control over with these basics and what are you really going to struggle to control for your teenager? So an example of this is you can control some of the food that's coming into the house. You can make sure there are healthy options. You can make sure that um, there are opportunities for doing exercise that you are giving them chances to join you with doing something other than being on a screen. You can make sure that, um, you know, there is an understanding that sleep is important and that everybody's going to bed. You could have a family rule about when the Wi-Fi goes off. There are some things you can control without being punitive and there are other things that you will find much harder con to control without going down that slightly punitive route that we talked about before. And the things you can't control is how much they're going to work with you on this. Now, you can encourage them, and we're coming on to that in a minute, about how they can get there, but there are some things that you cannot force. But think about what you can control, what you can put in place, what you can think about, that you know is your starting point. This next slide um, seems very obvious when you think about it, but actually isn't all that obvious sometimes to teenagers. So mm -hmm. for you as parents, have a look at this and um, let's go through it now. But once you feel like you are more on side with your teenager, they're able to listen to you, they feel like um, you're interested in them, you're spending a little bit of time with them, even if it's doing things that you don't really want to be doing with them, you'd rather spend your time with them differently. Once you've joined them where they are, it might be worth, when, there's, when everybody's feeling calm, um, to draw this out with them and just, be really empathic and say, look, I've noticed you don't really seem like yourself at the moment. It seems like you're quite fed up, that you know, you're struggling to have energy or, or that you're feeling like you're sorry, on the edge know. quite a lot. I can hear you. I think somebody needs to mute themselves. Thank you. Um, and so point out to them that you can see in this cycle that, you know, they're not feeling themselves. They seem like they're quite low at times or just really fed up or like it's hard to get into things. And once you're in that position, it's um, what quite often happens is when people's mood slips, they withdraw, they tend to isolate themselves more, they stop doing some of the things that they usually enjoy, they find it hard to have energy to, to do anything that they know will be helpful for themselves. And then in return, they you, it is a bit of a cycle, the red cycle, you tend to get less enjoyment from life. Um, but if you can push yourself, instead of withdrawing from things that you usually would enjoy and get some benefit from. If you can start thinking about what matters to me, what do I get enjoyment from? What do I get fulfillment from? What can I take back some control of in my life? If you can help teenagers think a little bit about that, then actually if you can start putting some of those things in place and doing more of those things that matter and give you a sense of fulfillment or achievement or enjoyment or feeling close to somebody else, if you can do more of those things, what tends to happen is then you can start to, uh, it starts to build on itself. You feel a bit better. You tend to get more enjoyment out of life. 
then again, you that encourages you, that has an impact, encourages you to do more of those things because you start feeling a bit better. And I think drawing this out with teenagers, once you've got to a stage where they will let you, and they feel like you're not going to nag or lecture them, but that you can say, look, I'm genuinely interested in thinking about this with you. What sort of things matter to you? What are you missing at the moment from before lockdown? What are some of the things you used to do? And they might say, you know, well, I was part of a football team or a whatever team, and of course can't do that now. And, you know, there will be a bit of negativity. Try and sit with it, don't rise to it, but just say to them, OK, so one of the things that you really used to get enjoyment out of was football or whatever sport or whatever it is they've said. And then just to ask them, you know, how can we build on some of that now? And if they come back with, well, I can't, there's no, no sports allowed, I'm not allowed to do any of that. Again, try and stay calm, try and not rise to it but just do a little bit of thinking with them around it and give them some gentle encouragement. So once you've asked them what they used to enjoy doing or what they've noticed they're doing less of at the moment, you can acknowledge that things are quite different at the moment, but try and get into a questioning mode. Try not to give them advice or tell them what to do because what we all know about teenagers is as soon as you step in with advice, one of the first things they quite often do is kind of roll their eyes or take a step back or say, well, what would you know? Or, you know, um, or they'll or they might nod along, but then not do any of it. So try and step away from giving advice and just think about some gentle questions where you can prompt and guide them. You know, what sort of things could you do? How could you make that work now? Are there any adaptations you could make? Are there any YouTube videos around football that we could watch? Um, what would it be like to go out in the park um, and have a bit of a knock around with me? Um, you can ask them to think ahead. Um, hold on to some hope. Lockdown isn't going to go on forever. What are the things you would like to line up? What are the things you would like to plan for when lockdown finishes? Um, what would be on your wish list to get started with as soon as you're able? Which friends would you like to see first? Now you have to time all of this and you don't want to make it into an inquisition, but it's just about when you can drop it into the conversation, they feel like you're actively listening to them and you're genuinely curious about their answers. Most teenagers will open up. Um, they might tell you when they've had enough and you can say, okay, I get it. You know, there's enough of this. You don't want me to push you too hard. But you can also just give the general understanding or give the message to them that you're interested and that there are things they can do. And then a good way of framing it is to say to them, put them in charge and say, look, I'm hearing you. It all feels like too much at the moment or you're just so fed up that you can't do it exactly the way you want to. That right now you are just feeling cross. But when you feel ready, what small step might you take to getting started on doing some of this? Or is there something else that you think you'd be interested in giving a go? When you're ready, if there's any way I can help you, I would like to. So you can set the scene for them. And that idea of when you feel ready, don't underestimate it because um, I think what happens a lot with teenagers is when you first make a suggestion or when you first help them think about things, for most of them, there is an automatic negative pushback. They will push back or they will tell you you don't understand or no, I could never do that. No, that's not right. But actually you plant a seed and that seed, if you just give it a little bit of encouragement or you just inquire about how they're doing or you set the scene and say, well, I know you said you didn't really want to do any exercise, but I, I would really like to go for a walk. It would be lovely if you'd join me. I'm thinking of doing it at the weekend. Have a think about it, see how you feel. So you set the scene, you plant the seed, and then even if you get pushed back at first, give them a little bit of time. Um, and what you might find is they mull it over and you think that they're not doing anything with it. And then suddenly without any fuss, you might notice that they're doing something different or they've started doing something and then might tell you and then you get a chance to be really curious and interested in it. But even if they don't, don't make a fuss about it. 
if teenagers start something new and they don't tell you or don't make a big deal of it, respect that. Because the danger is if you get overexcited and say, great, you went for a walk with a friend, that's fantastic. They're going to feel a bit self-conscious. It might put them off doing it again. So just keep your comments understated. Keep them low key, but be very clear with them that if there are any ways you can help, you're up for it. That's the best thing you can do is be the supportive person who's ready. And do try and stay calm. I mean, it is irritating if you're trying to help somebody and they are not willing to be helped. But just know that idea of you getting on side, showing some empathy, staying calm yourself and just being that offering that supportive position. That will do a lot more than you think it will. So don't feel discouraged, even if you feel like, well, that was a waste of time. It wasn't. And it is about this idea of planting a seed, watering it a bit, um, that drip drip approach and seeing if it will grow. One of the things that we really know is helpful for, um, well, everybody actually, not just is having some routine. Now they have lost uh, some of their routine by not getting up in the morning, getting ready, going out the door and getting to school and seeing friends. But they do have some ability to still put a routine in place. We've got a half term coming up next week. So thinking about how they want to spend the week, helping them think about some things that really matter to them. Is there some work they need to get done? When might they want to do that? Would they like to schedule it? Um, where, would they like to think about what else they're going to do around that? And thinking about what's important to them, are the things that they have to get done? Now, the examples on here probably won't resonate with most teenagers. Tidying their room is never high on their priority, nor helping parents with chores. But if there are other things they want to do, like things they want to look up, or if they're into politics or environment, or environmental issues, anything like that, Help them think about other particular things they want to do next week. Think about who matters to them, who, which friends would they like to try and do something with next week. They are allowed to go out for an hour each day with one other person. Is there somebody who lives locally with them that they would like to see? How might they make that happen? Um, is that something they could suggest? How might they suggest it? Again, plant the seed and say to them, you've got a whole week, let's map it out. It looks very empty at the moment. Let's think about what we can do together as well. And then thinking about what's important to them just for pure enjoyment. Are there things that, do they have any hobbies or interests that they have neglected recently because they just haven't felt like they've got much energy? Are there any things that they would like to reconnect with, particularly next week because we've got a half term, but generally? Um, are there any things that they want to do to kind of help look after themselves, um, give themselves a bit of relaxation, give themselves a treat? When are they going to schedule some exercise in? Doesn't have to be full blown going for a run, but are there some things they would like to do to get them get their body moving? Are there some things they can help or engage with you in? What would it be like if they help cook dinner one night? Or are there some things that they might want to do with you, like watching, having a film one evening? Get them to think about how they want to fill their time rather than just this endless open block that can feel never ending and draining. And then it's too hard to get up in the morning and think, oh, I can't be bothered to do anything. And then they just sort of drift for the day. Whereas if you help them try and think in advance, they might not put much in, but it will help to get them to a position where they can start thinking about, actually, that's a lot of time to fill. What am I going to do? What would I like to do? Are there some things I could arrange? If they're really struggling to think about anything, or if, say, they want to meet a friend, but they don't know how to um, get in contact with them, or they feel self-conscious about it, or they think they might get knocked back, it's quite good to help them think about problem solving and what they can do in a very structured way if they've got something they're finding it difficult to get through. So help them think about what is the problem I'm struggling with. Help them list all of the possible solutions. Um, 
even if they feel a bit silly, think of as many ways as they can around this. What might they do? Um, and then help them weigh it up, balance what it's going, what's going on. You know, what are the pros? What are the cons of each of these possibilities? Which one do they think is most feasible? Are there any consequences that might come out of them? And then get them to choose one that they're going to try first uh, and think is plan doable. What might get in the way? How would I manage that? Who would help me? Uh, and the aim is just to get them seeing that there are there are far more than one way, far more ways than one way of doing something. Um, it's a bit of a developmental thing. Lots of teenagers get very rigid. They come up with a solution and then they say, well, that wouldn't work. So what's the point? And they get very fixed and then they throw the whole thing out the window. If when you're in a calm moment, if you can say to them, actually, it'd be quite good to do this in a structured way. Let's just have a think about it. And try, it's just encouraging some flexibility of thinking, helping them see that actually there often is more than one solution. They may not like many of the solutions, but they are options. And if they really wanted to get there and they really wanted to do this and it was very important to them, then sometimes actually choosing a solution that we don't feel great about, but we know would be helpful, then it puts it on the table. It's up to them whether they decide to go with it or not. But what you're helping them see is actually it's not that there isn't a solution. It's just that the solutions that are there you're not quite there yet, you're not quite with it, but they could be doable once you feel ready. Um, so this is um, an example of a bit of problem solving around the issue, a problem of I've got too much work to do, I can't get it all done, it's impossible. So what you could ask them to do is list all the possible solutions and continue to avoid it. Carrying on doing the same is always a solution. So not, it doesn't feel very doable as a parent, it's not what you want them to do, but doing nothing is always a solution and there are consequences to that and they can choose whether they want to carry on down that path because it's the default position or whether there are other things that they could do. So there's a bit of a silly one in there which might appeal to younger um, teenagers or they might just roll their eyes and say, yeah, right. But I suppose what you're doing is just opening up the opening up possibilities so thinking about planning, you can avoid it. You could do some of it, but not um, all of it. You could try and prioritise. You could spend half an hour a day doing work just to kind of plod through it. There are lots of possibilities. So it's just opening up this idea that, well, it's not doable, I can't do it. Just trying to get them to think about there are a lot, of, there's a huge range, but, um, you know, have a think and when you're ready, and if you really want to do something about it, then you will choose which one feels most doable to you. So I'm afraid there is no magic bullet to this. There is no um, simple solution to motivating a teenager who's really fed up. But there are some things you can do. One of the first things is think about your own position. You cannot uh, help a teenager if you are feeling stressed, frantic, on edge yourself. So take a moment to think about what you can do for yourself in order for you to be able to stay calm when you're with a teenager who quite likely is going to be a bit irritating. Um, your main focus needs to be on building a connection with them. They will not do anything or you can't help them if you are at loggerheads with them. So if you are still in the giving advice, nagging, uh, setting them up, uh, pushing them really hard when they're not on board with you, what you're going to do is you can build resentment. You're not going to build connection. Think about a good relationship with your teenager as the foundation from which they can launch themselves. They need a solid base. They need to know that you are on their side. They need to know that you are going to be a supportive safety net to come back to if they need it and they really need to know that um, you are trying to understand their position and that takes a bit of biting your tongue. It takes a bit of self-control as a parent and it 
takes a real step back to think, actually, I'm just going to prioritise getting on board with them, giving them some empathy, trying to understand their position, no matter how difficult you might find it or how many solutions you think you've got if they would just do it. And a common response that I hear a lot from parents is they're just not helping themselves or they won't let me help them. And the way to get around that is to take a step back, really try and meet them where they are, engage with what is interesting them or what they're doing at the moment, spend some downtime that is just, um, you know, it's not driven, there isn't a focus to it, just concentrate on spending a little bit of time with them. And then once you've got that platform from which they're able to hear some of the good things you can say to them, is then you can start thinking with them about, uh, you know, I've noticed your sleep is really all over the place. You seem to be staying up very late at night and then that means you're quite tired during the day. You know, how are you feeling about that? How are you getting through the day? Is this how you want to continue? What would it be like if we could work on a way of getting you more sleep? Um, or you can say to them, you know, you and I both know that getting your body moving and doing some exercise can really help learning, uh, help you feel better. It's a big part of it. But I also can see that you really don't have much energy at the moment. Um, at what do you think might be a good starting block? What do you think you could do? How can I help? Are there some things we could do together? And then you can prompt and push a bit, but without getting to a stage where you're at the threatening, nagging mode. I mean, parents do have to hold a firm line with some things. So if there are some things you feel really clear on, um, then it's OK to be firm, but be gentle with it. Try not to get down the punitive road where you are taking things away from them because you're just going to build up huge resentment. Try and get them on board with it rather than getting threatening. And if you are really worried about your teenager and you just think, gosh, actually, this is more than just fed up and unmotivated, you're really worried about their low mood, seek some other support. Go to your GP or um, a lot of our teams are in schools at the moment. Go to your school and ask if there's other support. Now, our teams, the mental health support teams, um, we're in schools, so we're in the schools in Merton from where this talk has originated. Go back to your school and just say, I'm worried about my child um, and get them on board. We have people who can see um, young people who are um, feeling low or feeling anxious um, and we tend to work at a sort of mild to moderate early intervention level. So we try and get in there early. And if young people are really quite low and we're worried about them, then we help support moving on to a service where they can get more help. And uh, for you as parents, seek out some support if you need it. Talk to other parents, work out if what, you know, look, it is normal at the moment to be fed up and unmotivated. But if you're worried that it's gone beyond that, then don't, don't sit on it. It's OK to go and ask your GP or your school or seek out other friends. And most of all, the best thing you can do for your teenager is try not to join them in the despair too much. You don't want to be overly positive in front of them so they feel like you're not able to hear anything difficult. But hold on to hope. Hopefully we're coming out of lockdown. Hopefully things are going to be moving on. Things will shift. And it's about just holding on to that idea that um, they don't have to be stuck in this position. There are other things that um, are, you know, are coming up. So even if your teenager is not very hopeful, try and hold on to some of that for yourself. At least, most of all, just so that you don't feel too despairing about them as well. So I've come to the end of the talk. We've got some time for questions. Um, I'm going to come out of the talk. Um, so that's just a bit about some of our teams. I'm going to come out.